Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 479. Length of life versus quality of life. Which way should medicine go? BioBalance Health features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the newly released book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of T replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Well, it's, it's a rapidly burgeoning conversation in the field of medicine. Mm-hmm. Specialists from different domains have opinions about it, and that's what we want to talk about this week. For years, doctors were trained to believe that medical success, doing the right job, doing the best job, involved buying more time for someone to be alive. No matter what their state. No matter what their state. Not, no matter whether they were in a coma, no matter whether they were in a nursing home and couldn't think and couldn't take care of themselves or had their children putting diapers on them, it was still success because that patient was alive. So is that medicine absent lawyers or is that medicine with lawyers? They're saying you've got to keep them alive no matter what. Even if they're in a coma, you have to do all these things and keep them alive. Uh, you can't I, I don't facilitate. know. I don't know if you can take lawyers out of medicine. I don't know if you could ever take lawyers out of medicine right. because even... When I was trained, we thought about malpractice and and, I think and we have that to, type of thing. But I don't. I think it's more than just medicine, law, and science—the science of medicine and the research that goes into telling us what's good for us, what isn't good for us. Uh, it also goes into society, how we view life. So, so I don't think you can separate these. But, yeah. but the state of medicine. Even currently, when I look at articles from all different specialties, in general, it's about, well, how long did the patient live? The success of a drug right. was, how long does the patient live longer than they would live if they didn't take it? So so that's about just life. It doesn't matter if you're vomiting every day or you're miserable or you hurt and you would prefer to die right. <laughs> because the treatment's so bad. It's just about how long you live, which makes it a very simplistic kind of medical choice. But it's not. Or it appears simplistic. to be, but it's not. Yeah. It's not. It's it's really when we when we follow the rules and do the things we're supposed to do. Oftentimes, I would see people come back from oncology oncologists, and they would have been given chemotherapy. They were miserable, and they knew they were going to die anyway. Well, it was you know, it was to lengthen their and, life, but it didn't really make them have any quality. Well, and, and it, it's a reference to a specific target. You know, we're going to defeat cancer. You may have other things going on, but we're going to kill this cancer. Mm-hmm. We're going to win. And we're going to treat you. And the treatments are pretty horrible. And then they'll say something like, sometimes you have to get worse before you get better. And mm-hmm. we'll turn the corner. That's true. And so we'll use these treatments and we'll turn the corner because our focus, our target is cancer. And then they may have other things like diabetes or heart disease or obesity that are going to kill them. Or, or mm-hmm. prostate disease, mm-hmm. you know. Well, that's a cancer, so maybe. It's, but it's a, it's a the whole the field of medicine in total is a very amorphous mass. But there are within it major themes, major trends, major discussions, major mm-hmm. focal points. And for years, the predominant one has been: we measure our success by keeping you alive longer. Right. And, and, and not addressing the question, not, not, not answering, not even addressing the question, what's your quality of life? So, for, ex- for example, when I take care of people who are menopausal and they are miserable, they can't sleep, they have hot flashes all the time, they sweat, they can't go to work, they've stopped being able to be productive, they're angry at their spouse, their spouse is angry at them, their life is one miserable mess because they don't have hormones. So, and, and, and within six years, by 2025, they say there will be 1.1 billion, with a B, women who are menopausal. Right. And medicine needs to treat them. Right. Well, and medicine should treat them. Yeah. But But what medicine says is, and what the, uh, a study uh, in 2001 or two said was, WHI study said, oh, it's dangerous. It'll give you, uh, uh, it'll give you breast cancer. But 
that wasn't true. That was the headline. How, but it doesn't matter if it was true or wasn't true. That means that the next 30 years of your life are going to be absolutely miserable. Because most women go through menopause around the age of 50. 50. And the average life expectancy, For at least in the United is in the States, 80s. is low 80s. Mm -hmm. So 32, four years of being miserable with those symptoms every month, mm -hmm. uh, all the time. But the fact is, that's not true. But even if it was true... They're saying you should be miserable for 30 years because you worry about breast cancer, which is one in 12, one in eight, depending okay. on how old you are. So it becomes more common as you get older, of course. 95% of them are not ever going to get breast cancer anyway. Right. And but, then those that do, some will die and some will live. Right. And that's, and that's kind of the same mental activity doctors do with other things like anything that would make your life better, but it's going to possibly cause you pain and misery. So, so this is, it's, it's a meant, it's a, it's a way to think about medicine, but it's also a way to think about medical research. Cause when I look at medical research, I rarely see quality of life cause the quality of life is hard to measure. Quality of life was better for these people if they did this. I usually see they lived another year, they lived a year longer than everybody else. Right. Or, but they don't talk about what kind of life that was. So we've had some, um, I've had a lot of experience with nursing homes um, and that type of thing with friends, families, but my family as well. Right. And um, my family, my parents were so afraid of cancer, they wouldn't take any hormones at all. And they became brittle. They, my dad shrunk three, three inches because his knees went away. He didn't believe in surgery. He didn't get his knees replaced. He was in pain his whole life. He, he basically was going for the length of life, but not the quality of life. Right. And he got the length of life. He lived to be 92. So yay, but he had 10 years of just absolute misery. He was angry. He was upset. And he, <laughs> he wanted to die. But of course, you can't decide to die. And, and that's something I want people to know. You can't just get old and say, oh, I want to die. I want to get out of this misery. Because if you've led your life up to living a long life, but you've been, but you've, you've taken money out of the bank you didn't have, you've been, you've been uh, partying and drinking and and doing all these things that make you sick or not following doctor's orders. When you get to the end, you don't just get to die. Usually, usually it's just misery until your time is up. Yeah. So you don't get to decide. My dad was so surprised that he couldn't just decide to die, and it just didn't work for years and years. <laughs> So you, you've been you've been in this circumstance lately. I have, I have and lately. you've been working and you've been in nursing homes watching people. Just this week, just I, I have a ninety year old aunt who's in a nursing home right now, and just exists. She's fallen. She fell in her driveway looking for her cat, and in that fall, she shattered her hip and her elbow and busted her head. So they had to do surgery to replace her elbow or fix it, but put a plate on it, and screws, mm -hmm. and replace her hip, and they had to put staples in her head, and now she's in a nursing home. I, just saw her this week, and in the mornings, she's very lucid and alert and very much herself, but as the day wears on, she starts to develop what they call sundowners, mm -hmm. where she becomes delirious and incoherent mm -hmm. and angry, mm -hmm. and, and normally just sweet as pie, mm -hmm. but in the afternoon, she's mean, and she's nasty to the help, and, mm -hmm. and people are trying to help her. And we, she doesn't want to be that way. When she's lucid, mm -hmm. she doesn't want to be that way. And she, mm -hmm. But she doesn't have any control over it. Mm -hmm. And so then the question becomes, do you have an option? And should medicine consider options that help you avoid being in those situations? We're not talking about end-of-life care because we don't have an answer for that. Right. We're talking, about, we're talking about 20 years ahead of time. Diagnosis and preventive 30 years medicine. ahead of Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Changing your lifestyle. How can the next generation not all end up in nursing homes? Right. Because the way we're eating and the way we're becoming more obese, we're getting more dementia. We're getting, we're, we're getting more cancers. We're we're not taking care of ourselves. Diabetes. We don't exercise. An epidemic. I mean, exactly. All of those things have to do with what you're going to feel like when you're 90. And do you have a quality of life? Can you live on your own, or are your children going to be changing your diapers? So one of the emerging trends in the mass of medicine is the trend towards focusing on quality of life mm -hmm. and on preventing illnesses, not just treating symptoms that pop up mm -hmm. or fixing it when something gets broken, but trying to avoid it ever getting broken. Mm -hmm. And that's the 
nature of the practice that you have built at mm-hmm. Biobalance Health. And, mm-hmm. and your statement to me is, I need lead time to help these people avoid these illnesses that are affiliated or associated with aging. Mm-hmm. So if, if you don't want to get fragile and have a lot of falls and have a lot of breaks, mm-hmm. then you need to maintain muscle mass. So mm-hmm. we've got to do something. Well, they will give you muscles or help you have muscles by the time you get to the point where most people are falling because they don't have them, mm-hmm. which is what happened to my aunt. Mm-hmm. I mean, she weighs 85 pounds. But she, her muscle mass is low. She doesn't have And any. when your muscle yeah. mass goes down, then your bones thin even more rapidly. Right. Because it's the tension more that your good. muscles, when your muscles tighten up, it's that tension that it, those muscles pull on your bone and make them stronger. It stimulates the deposition of calcium. So, so that is one of the things we look at, in, and we, we can't really change the life of people who have already, who have already gotten to ninety, and medicine is still keeping alive. We can't really do that. <laughs> we can't do anything about that. But we can change the lives of people who are fifty and up as they go forward, and give them a better quality of life by having them take care of themselves. Everybody I talk to goes, well, I feel fine, and but Today. they're smoking and they're drinking and they're yeah. eating junk food every day, and and they don't necessarily look great. They don't care right. because all of the, these things they do have become so ingrained that it's hard to get out of them. And society says it's okay. Well, that was another thing that I noticed at the nursing home. I talked to my wife about it because uh, we were there at lunch, and, and they get everybody that's mobile into this lunchroom and feed them their lunch. And we were looking around the room, and 75% of these people were obese and had such an inability to stand up or walk. I mean, it, as a matter of fact, while we were there, some woman graduated from uh, this home and, and had gotten enough movement and mobility back that she could go home. Mm-hmm. They, they called the staff together, and they, they created a gauntlet on two sides, <laughs> put this woman in her wheelchair at one end of the gauntlet, and then they play the Rocky music. <laughs> <laughs> and she stands and walks the length of this gauntlet while everybody claps and cheers because she's gotten strong enough now she can go home, and that's a victory for them. That's unusual. <laughs> I saw it happen. But that's I, was, I was really surprised. Yeah. That's quality of life. So they are, there are places that quality of life is encouraged in medicine, but it, it doesn't always, to me, it doesn't always seem like people are being taught there. Like they go to the cardiologist, they go, yeah, you on your medicine? You taking that? Yeah, they don't say, how do you feel? Are you, you know, maybe they'll say, are, are you out of breath? But they don't say, how's your life? Do, you know, are you able to get up and do things that you like to do? That's not the conversation because medicine has become, let's look at your numbers and not at you. That's, unfortunately, when I was in medical school, that's 40, over 40 years ago. Oh, 40 years ago. When I was in medical school, they said, 90% of your diagnosis will come from talking to your patient. And they, I bet they don't say that now. Interesting. Because that was our theme. Every time we'd say, but the labs say, and they say, but what did your patient say? Right. Now, that was 40 years ago. Now we've become so advanced. We have all these machines and all these numbers. They just say, look at the numbers. Hmm. Now, that doesn't really tell, tell me what the quality of life is of my patient. I have to ask them how they are, really, not just, okay, I mean, how you really are. Are well, you sleeping? Are you eating? Are you happy? Are it, you? It's not so much medicine. It's an approach to life. And I was talking this week when I was in, in Arkansas to see my aunt, her son, who is, uh, has a plumbing license and air conditioning license, mm-hmm. and he was running this company, and he sent one of his workers to this house on a call. And the woman of the house explained what was going wrong with her air conditioning. Mm-hmm. You know, what, why did you call me? Well, because this is happening with my air conditioning system. And he totally dismissed what she had to say. He plugged up his equipment and he said, well, the, the machines tell me this. And so my, my cousin Mark was saying to him, you need to listen to her. She can tell you what More you than need that to machine. know. Yeah. And so, and, and I said, well, what do you mean? And so then Mark repeated the things that she had told this guy. And he said, what that tells me is that the condenser coil is freezing up and needs to be cleaned out because the cycle of hot and cold issues that she's mm-hmm. having in the puddle of water mm-hmm. on the floor says this thing is freezing up in the evening and then she's not getting heat because the condenser is frozen and then it melts in the morning and you mm-hmm. get water on the floor. So what that tells you without hooking anything up to it is go look at the condenser. He's a diagnostic- diagnostician. Well, but it's the same thing that you say about medicine. Mm-hmm. If you talk to the patient and listen to what they're describing, mm-hmm. 
you catch things about thyroid. I mean, you mm-hmm. do a blood test and it says, well, my thyroid is fine. And then you say, well, your hands are cold all the time. and, and Your you, hair's falling out, your, tongue your is, skin's dry, your tongue's fat. Yeah. You know, you're, you're having trouble talking. <laughs> hey, you're talking to me. I got, <laughs> and yeah, and so then you bad. say, well, let's treat this with thyroid. Or with iodine first and then with thyroid. And, and so that's a skill that you have learned both in school they taught you that, mm-hmm. but in 30 years of practice in medicine, you learned that. And that's critical. And that's that's mostly, I mean, I use lab work as a guide, but I don't use it as my complete decision on how to treat a patient because symptoms are more important. And right. most of my patients, they get thyroid and go to a specialist, which is an endocrinologist. Their specialist sits them down and says, well, your labs say you're fine. Here's your prescription. Bye. So they don't say, are you cold? Is your hair falling out? I mean, they don't ask them those questions. Now, I'm not talking about every endocrinologist. Please don't send me letters. I'm talking about some of the ones I know that where their patients end up in my office. Right. And those people deserve better than that. That's not what they're paying for. You know, they could use a computer to tell them with, whether the lab was normal or not. Well, you were talking about menopause and the fact that so many people now are, uh, the population is aging into the, the place where so many women mm-hmm. are menopausal. Mm-hmm. And you said that menopause causes an estrogen and a testosterone deficiency. Right. And so the primary symptoms of an estrogen deficiency, when you're talking to a woman and mm-hmm. she said, and you're saying, well, how do you feel? What's going on in your life? How, mm-hmm. how do you sleep? Mm-hmm. And you look at her and you listen to her. These are the things that she will tell you that she has that tell you she's got an estrogen problem. Right. So that's generally the first thing is hot flashes. Not everyone with low estrogen or menopause has a hot flash. So what is a hot flash? Hot flash is where <laughs> a hot flash is where you feel an internal heat for a few minutes. It may it comes and goes. Just like flood you. Like it floods you and you feel like you need to strip down all your clothes, your face gets red, and you feel like if you could just get all your clothes off, you'd feel better. That's that's the. I remember when my wife was was having this issue, (laughs) we'd go to bed and cover up and fall asleep, and I mean on a cold night because we Mm -hmm. try to keep the house a little cool at night. And in the middle of the night, she'd kick all the covers off, and she'd be sweating, and Mm -hmm. her pajamas would be all wet, and Mm -hmm. the sheets would be all. Yeah, a lot of people have to change their sheets through the night. She would look at me with anger, like I was doing something. (laughs) Well, she was just frustrated. Frustrated. Well, I I learned that, but it took a while. (laughs) But that's, it is frustrating, and, and it does, it, and so that disturbs your sleep. Well, and that's a couple of these other things, irritability, night yeah. sweats, yeah. Uh, depression. So um, um, mood swings, you yeah. know, where you don't know who's coming home every day. Um, <laughs> vaginal dryness and painful intercourse. Or you don't know who you're coming home to, to. every okay. day. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So uh, vaginal dryness and painful inter- intercourse is one of the big complaints that my patients have. And interesting, just a little bit of estrogen systemically will fix that. But the drugs that they have for that are so low dose. And I don't know why they think low is better because it just doesn't make sense. They don't do that with anything else. Well, they've been taught give low doses of everything. But estrogen, you have to give the right dose. You don't just give a low dose. So they, they they need more estrogen to make their vaginas better. So if they can't take systemic estrogen, then you have to use two or three of the do- doses that are approved by the FDA to get somebody's vaginal dryness to stop. But they don't and think... And KY, think, by the way, it just doesn't cut it for 90% of, of the patients. Well, but they kind of think if, if you're an older woman, you, you had your time in the, in the sack. Well, I've heard from, I've heard from young, healthy uh, doctors, both men and women, that they're just shocked that my patients want to have sex after 45. Yeah. And I'm like, that... that Clearly, they're younger than forty-five, so they they will they'll figure it out later. But they they just don't believe that people still have sex after forty-five. Yeah. I can't say that <laughs> most doctors don't have that have, have the social like we don't spend our time socializing. We spend our time reading, so we basically don't have all that that socializing that tells you that people have these problems. So another one of the symptoms that you list here are increased allergies. So mm-hmm. if you don't have enough estrogen, mm-hmm. you're going to have more allergic reactions to mm-hmm. things. Is that an increased number of allergic experiences or is that an increased number of things that you're allergic to? A number to? of things that you're allergic to. Wow. In general. That's so people start getting hay fever. Estrogen protects and, you from allergies. Yeah. Estrogen protects you a lot. It protects your skin from aging. It protects your hair. It helps your hair grow. It also um, it also helps you with your bones, every bit of your connective tissue so that your face doesn't fall. So, so your, it's very important. Your argument to a woman is consider replacing your lost estrogen so mm-hmm. that you can avoid all of these symptoms mm-hmm. 
that lead to other complications right. that become diseases that in, cripple you. Right, and low estrogen leads to um, actual increase in your cholesterol and increase in the inflammation in your body and then heart disease. Okay. So then, and low estrogen it's leads like a pyramid. leads to depression yeah. and it leads to dementia. So it, you can you can back <laughs> off dementia by ten years if you take estrogen when you when you go through menopause. The onset of, of the on, at the onset of menopause. If you're going to be one of those people that has that issue, right? So it's almost like going into a classroom and erasing most of the stuff that's on the chalkboard, mm -hmm. and have a nice clean slate that you can ride because on for your life for your quality of life. It also it also helps. It also helps you think you can do recall. Testosterone is also important, you know, with so recall. It, yes. And so testosterone goes away when your estrogen goes away. For so women, For women? For women, or even before your estrogen goes away, for some women. So if you don't have, uh, if you lose your estrogen I and testosterone, people come in and go, oh, I can't think anymore. Do I have dementia? And they're like 45 or 50. No, you don't have dementia yet. Let me see what happens you when I give testosterone. you back testosterone yeah. and estrogen and see what your brain does then. And then they're like, yeah, I got re my recall back. So the symptoms, if you, again, yeah. versus lab work. I mean, mm -hmm. you do, I do get lab, lab work. work and evaluate mm -hmm. that, but you also listen to the quality of life symptoms that they're telling you. Right. So, so I always ask them about the symptoms they came to me with, right. which I had them fill out a, a questionnaire and we talk about it. So low libido, so no sex drive. And poor orgasms. Not not only I can't get it up anymore, but I don't want to. Yeah, for women, it's like, no, not on my list. Yeah. You know, you just yeah. don't have any desire. And so that breaks up a lot of marriages. So socially, it's dangerous. Why don't you dangerous. go watch the ball game, honey? <laughs> yeah, really. I, I'm just, I'm, yeah. I'm going to just fold the I'm laundry. Tired. I'm more interested in that. Yeah. You know, that's what it makes you feel yeah. like. It does work on your brain and it makes you have a desire. So that's important, especially for, for couples. Uh, weight gain gets worse after you lose your testosterone. You lose muscle. You gain fat where that muscle was. So you don't burn as many calories. That also can make you cool, not feel as warm as you should. Right. Uh, depression and anxiety go up when you don't have testosterone. So we always see a lot of depression and anxiety at 45, which may just be related to your hormones. New depression and new anxiety. Sugar cravings. Yeah. And that's awful. <laughs> I hate sugar cravings. It happens when we have not enough progesterone and not enough testosterone. And is that because your body doesn't have enough energy and it's, it's the, you get the sugar high or you get the sugar fix for a short burst of time? I'm, I'm not sure exactly what is released. I know that we become more insulin resistant. Right. So our insulin goes up. I'm not sure how that reacts on the brain. I can't, I can't you tell know you that, that there. part. Okay. I just know that it happens. And, and, and fatigue? Terrible fatigue. Just like, I don't, I, you know, I, I get home and I go to bed. And, you know, I can't, I work and I go to bed. So, but yes, yesterday, every single person that came in and said, what about this belly fat? Yeah. You know, and right. that's, it changes the shape of your body. So when you lose your testosterone, you lose your shoulders, you lose your muscle. And so all of that just goes right to the center. So, and you start getting this big belly fat stuff. And it's, you know, when you get testosterone, it takes a year or so for you to, you know, get rid of that if you do diet and exercise. So as we talk about the focal points of medicine, life expectancy versus a healthy life, the quality, quality of life, life expectancy, you're coming down on the side of the quality of life expectancy. And what you're saying is if I get access to somebody early enough in the cycle mm -hmm. to make changes in their life, mm -hmm. those changes can help them avoid most of these illnesses that old people get. Right. Many, many or most. Right. So, and so I, but it doesn't, you know, doing all these things doesn't impair your length of life. Right. It doesn't sh cut you short. It doesn't cut you short, but it just gives you that quality. Makes of what life. you have better. So it's, ju it's just a way of looking at health and looking at what you do today, just like it, if you were saving money for the future. You're saving your body for the future. So it really, even if you say it doesn't really help me now, it will help you in the future. So look for a doctor that will talk to you about quality of life, especially as you age and have these issues and the quality of dying. You know, mm -hmm. to, Those discussions need to be had between the physician and the patient and the physician and the patient's family because those decisions will have to be made at some point. And you don't want, I would say, I don't want by default the decision to be do whatever we have to do to his body to buy him another month or another week or another day. Mm -hmm.
So you make your own decision. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.